Well, hello, church, from wherever you are, and we're getting check-ins from literally all over, and some names that have meant a great deal to Cammie and I for years and years and years. It's nice to see the reconnections going, and connections between here and you know, all over the U.S., but also Mexico, uh, Tanzania, places that are well beyond where most of us have traveled. Welcome home. It's good to have you here. Thank you for all your prayers. Uh, I am still recovering. The doctor says it's going to take a long time. I think he's probably a quack. Um, <laughs> but my wife has a high opinion of him. Therefore, it's going to take a while. But thank you for your prayers. And my, my friend knows I don't think he's a quack. We talked about the Holy Spirit and looked at Acts chapter 1 last week. But we need to dig in quite a bit more. And we need to take a look at that Acts chapter 1 again. So I'm going to do that. Acts chapter 1, this time reading from verse 4 to 11. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered round him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you've seen him go into heaven. It's, I always like that story because to me there are several duh is in there. You know, why are you looking up? Well, what would you do? You're standing there talking to Jesus. You have wrapped your life, your future, your faith, everything around Jesus. You ask him a specific question because you still don't understand that this is a spiritual kingdom. You think it's going to be a, a, a physical kingdom, maybe physical and spiritual, but there'll be a physical component. And once again, the throne of David will be occupied by somebody from his line. And he doesn't really answer it. And then he ascends up. And, now, and it wasn't something like he, he didn't say, something odd is about to happen. I need you to prepare yourselves. He just went. Angels standing there going, why are you looking up? Well, to angels, this wasn't much of a thing. To us, it was. As I studied this and studied what they would have heard and understood about the Holy Spirit and about what was going to happen to them, years and years ago, I read a book by Tim Woodruff and I started to wonder, as I wrote this letter, I read the lesson, how much of Tim was getting into the lesson. So Tim, if you're out there, I forget, but I'll put it this way. If it's really good, thank Tim Woodruff, any errors are mine. Is that fair? But I always, and I, about the same time I read Francis Chan's book, The Forgotten God, I was reading Tim's, and it was a great book. But let's go back. Let's back it up to that Passover night when Jesus ate what we call the Last Supper. It's a terrible night. And it's about to get much, much worse. Jesus has washed their feet. We know the story. We don't ever understand how to apply it, but he, he did. Jesus was the only one who knew that he was about to die in a terrible, horrible, evil way. And yet... He had to sit there and listen to the apostles argue about who outranked who among the apostles and who might outrank them in the kingdom of heaven. And therefore, I'm not washing your feet. You've got to wash the feet. Oh, no, I'm not washing the feet. Which, by the way, was not a happy job. It was not a pleasant job. I've been in churches before where I've seen foot washing take place as part of worship. And I understand it. And I understand it for them as an act of worship. Therefore, I'm not questioning it. But it's not the same as this. 
because the people knew there was going to be a foot washing thing, they'd pretty much prettied up their feet as much as possible before arriving at the building. These feet were not pretty. They had been walking in dirt and dust, and as we brought up before, animal exhaust, shall we say, since there are children uh, present. And it doesn't matter who you are, you're still a person. And I loved what Al said when he said, he is still a son of Adam. I get that, I really do. And here, absolutely, they still had what we would today call a class or corporate mindset of who outranks who. Who's in charge of who? And the sad thing is, almost every church has this as well. It has this, who's, who's the first, who's the boss, who's second. If they don't listen to me, then I'm out. If I can't say this, then... And all of these power moves. And so what is God going to do about this? Because Jesus is the son of God. If, if I had been God, uh, there would have been some yelling going on. Uh, there would have been thunder and lightning. A couple of disciples might have disappeared. But I'm not God, and for that we are all grateful. Jesus picked up a basin and a towel. And what was just read to you by Libby from New Jersey, and she always does such a great job, is the aftermath of this. He'd gone around, and while he was washing their feet, by the way, most of the apostles said nothing. And I imagine that Jesus was washing their feet with a look on his face that did not invite conversation. And that he might have been scrubbing a little bit more thoroughly than strictly necessary. Because Jesus knew what was coming and these people weren't ready and they're still trying to play soldiers on earth. And who gets what marble rather than preparing for the world to change and the universe to shift. He looks at them, he goes, do you understand? Oh, by the way, we all know Peter finally did speak up and go, no, you can't wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, I got nothing to do with you. He goes, then wash whatever you need. And Jesus goes, the feet will do. You know, it's, it's, we, we holy up this story a lot, but there are a lot of emotions going back and forth there. And then Jesus looks at him and goes, do you get it? Do any of you get this at all? By the way, the answer is no. But that's not dissing the apostles I, I think we all struggle with this we do the standard of behavior in the universe in God's kingdom now has nothing to do with class or identity or the social systems of this world if Jesus wanted to scream the world has changed and you're no longer living in the world you knew he couldn't have made this any plainer. And yet we still struggle and we, we try to find our identity. We try to find our meaning in the old world of power, class, identity. We shout down each other. When that doesn't work, we might shut down roads for our cause, which never wins a convert, by the way. No one ever says, you know, I was trying to get my wife to the hospital or I missed my airplane um, or I, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to get fired because I can't get to my job. I think I'll agree with the people blocking the road. It's, it's futile. Or we'll throw soup at an old painting and think that m means people should change their mind and go with us. Or we will declare our, our identity and then tell people they must back us up. All of these things are old world. We live in a new world. We're not defined by color, class, identity. We're not defined by politics. We are defined by Jesus the Christ who loved us, gave himself for us, and then said, follow me, do this. Which includes washing feet. Now, most of us will never have a washing feet moment. That's not, that's not um, a part of our culture, but... What it means is, voluntarily, openly, without being asked, take the lowest position and serve, because in this new universe, that's the high position. The giving, the serving, the sharing, that's the high. Brother Eric did a great devotional on our giving, and, and Eric, I remember the day my mind shifted on it.
I remember it really well. We had been in America for maybe a year that time, I think, when we were invited to the home of one of our deacons for lunch. And we were all in, because you know, this is the, we were in, so we went over. And I was really surprised when I went into the house, because there wasn't much there. It was a middle-class house, solidly middle, middle-class, but furniture was very sparse. And I, I'm a very, I'm a nut about privacy. So I wasn't going to look around and say, IRS issues? You got four kids in college? You know, what's, what happened here? Because I know the man had a very, and I'm trying to scrub the details out because I have not asked permission to tell this story and identify them. He had a very high position, not a rich man's paycheck, but a really good middle class paycheck from a nearby capital city. Well, I didn't say anything. And we ate at a simple table. Food was great. Fellowship was great. And I still just thought about it, kind of like Mary pondering these things in my heart. And then we had some missionaries come across to visit our church. And one of them was really struggling financially. And I was in the foyer doing the conversation. But when I looked over and saw this deacon talking to him, And he reached in his wallet and pulled out what could only be his paycheck. Paid twice a month, I knew, because he was a a government employee. He turned it over and signed the back of it and handed it to the missionary. Well, I went over to him and I said, "Um, I saw what you did. He goes, oh, I didn't want you to see that. And I said, and yet I did. Um, Do you do that often? And he said, no, no, not really just a few times a year. Well, think about what that means when you're paid every... And I said, I don't... How do you do that? And he just laughed, and he says, well, you know, the Lord gave us stuff. And I said, wait, does your wife do this too? And he said, you know, not not often. I said, once again, um, I'm looking for a detail. And he says, well, you know, a few times a year. And And he laughed. He said, sometimes we don't check with each other, and we write the same time. He said, that makes it an interesting few weeks, but we're okay. And I looked at him and I said, can you teach me how to do that? You know, I only open my wallet twice, once to put in the money, the others to make sure it's still there. George Washington blinks, he hadn't seen the light in so long. And so I, I need to learn from you. And I did, I did. It was like a switch. Here's a man with prestige when he is in full Uh, uniform of the day, shall we say, in his job. There are bits of silver glinting off that other people must show respect to. And yet, he was just giving. And his wife was just giving. And because of that, in my estimation, they had risen. Taking the basin and the towel in this new universe in which we find ourselves is to take a higher place. Jesus said, do you see what I am doing here. Jesus, after washing their feet, it was that night that he told them he was leaving them. And that sense of shock, betrayal, and loss they experienced, it would be very hard to overstate this. They, they'd given up everything to follow him. In fact, one of them had said that in those words. If he leaves now by death, by illness, by journey, their story ends and their hopes and their dreams end. Their dreams will die. Their lives will be meaningless. They will have to return to their home villages being laughing stocks for having bet on the wrong side and on the wrong guy. To make sure they even get that he really is leaving, it's interesting in John chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16, but especially In 13 and 16, in just those two chapters, he tells him he's leaving 10 times. I'm going. I'm going. Things are changing. And he's telling them, there's nothing you can do about this. The universe has shifted. It has changed. Does it sound familiar? None of us have asked for the hard resets in our society, whether it is political or whether it is Societal, when a hard reset comes, it's tough. COVID, science, isolation, churches kneecapped, breakdowns in social order, cities burning, our very reality of our genes tossed aside in an attempt 
to find another meaning, another identity. Oh, we need help. The apostles needed help. And help was on the way. The Holy Spirit is mentioned 33 times in the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic is just a church word that means they're telling basically the same story. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 33 times. And they all center, these, these showings about the Holy Spirit, they all center on what Jesus is doing. How the Holy Spirit works through him, how he works with Jesus. Very little is said about how he works with us. You really have to go to John to get any information about, well, what do we do now that we receive a gift of the Holy Spirit, his presence in our life? What's, what's going to happen? Well, remember that the Gospels show us the Holy Spirit working with Jesus to prepare him to reach a prepared world. Please look at the last five ser- sermons about this. The world the apostles were facing and the one we face is a very different world than the one Jesus faced. So we need to know, do we have any power, any assistance in surviving and thriving in this new world? I used to love watching Westerns. I probably still would if they were on. Um, and, and by the way, Westerns go all over the world. And so everybody thinks uh, if you're in America that you got a cowboy hat, a cattle, and you're probably wearing a gun. Only one of those is probably true in America, but we won't go into that. Um, All of us, you know, all of us little boys wanted to be cowboys too. And I don't know if this is true or not. I've been told it is true. But then again, the people that told me weren't certified historians at a major university. So in many of the movies, they will circle the wagons when they're under attack. I tell people, circle the wagons in your own life. What do you have? As God asked Moses, what do you have in your hand? What do you have? As the apostles brought the guy with just, the boy with just a little bit of bread and fish. What do you have? You need to every now and then sit down and go, all right, here are our resources. We, Cammy and I, as we pray every day, name our, our grands. We name our children. We name the ones they married. We name Cammy's parents now that mine are gone. We name you, our safe harbor people. We know we have resources. We know we could lean on you because you've, Well, we just know that's who you are. Jesus is now looking at the apostles saying, you better know what you've got and what you don't because this world is a very, very different world. I remember the first time I made the rookie error that we all do. We'd flown all over the world or traveled all over the world because my dad was uh, military then missionary. Missionary during my lifetime. And... I can remember landing once at Charles de Gaulle Airport outside of Paris. And I was just a teenager. And I looked out the window at the cars because back then your parking lot was right by the the runway. And my first thought was, they got a lot of foreign cars here. (laughs) It took a half second for the duh to hit and go, "Um, you're the foreign individual in in this equation? Yeah. So how are we going to do this? Well, Jesus gives them a crash course in the one who's coming to help them, the Holy Spirit. And as we said last week, this would have given them shudders. This would have given them shakes because the coming of the Holy Spirit in the Bible always arrives with thunder, lightning, smoke, power, earthquakes. And, and, and then he sorts out the planet. It used to be chaos, not anymore because the Holy Spirit came. And now he's coming to you. Don't leave Jerusalem. Take time this week to do what I asked you to do last week. Read John chapters 14, 15, and 16. Several times. You need to know about the one who is coming. Not just for the apostles, but for us as well. We see that in John 17 in Jesus' prayer. One is coming who will draw alongside you. Who will help you bear your burden. He will not remove it. Unless he wants to. Unless that fits somewhere with the plans of God. But he's not here to remove your burdens. He's here to help you through it. This is something I, I had to always remind people of whenever they would say, well, I can't take this or I can't stand it. And I would say, but you are. Instead of us talking about how you can't and are powerless, perhaps it would be better for us to figure out how, what tools do you have that have helped you stand this so far? And maybe we could take this into the future. 
got a call one night. I won't go through the whole story because it's too long, but it, it, was, it was interesting. Now, kids, back in the day, you didn't have phones that you could carry around. And uh, not even the wireless phones that your parents had that looked like a brick with a long pole on the end of it. And they were so excited because they could almost make it to the front door. <laughs> didn't have those. So one night, my phone rings. I pick it up. And there's a young lady there that got my number from, uh, you know, we'd made the foolish notion of, of actually publishing it in the, in the white pages, evidently. Found the church and number and called. And I was a counselor, so she called me. And she goes, I just want you to know, because I just want to tell somebody that I'm going to commit suicide tonight. And I said, I, well, I wish you wouldn't do that. And she goes, well, you don't even know me. I said, I know. But I still wish you would do it. She says, well, I have to. And I said, have you thought about this before? She goes, yes, yes. I've been thinking about this for years. And I said, well, then why are you going to do it tonight? And she hesitated. And we went on like this. And the whole point of it was two things. One, I said, well, I wish you wouldn't because I love you. And she said, no, you don't even know me. And I said, that's not part of the equation. I've made a decision. She goes, well, how can you love me if you don't know me? I said, because I chose to. And we had that discussion for a good 40 minutes or so. Uh, as long as you stick on your side and not pulled off subject, you can do that. And she once again talked about tonight. And I said, can you, if you've been thinking about this for, I think it was seven years, do you think you could hold out two more days until I could talk to you in person? She decided she could. First session didn't go well. She was the only person I've ever been able to say this about. After she left, she started whacking my car with her purse. That was new. That was new. And I, I figured, well, I just got it, but you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we were living in Ohio, so steel to rust, you know, it's going to happen. She later became a counselor and we're still in touch today. But all we had to do is, you can't handle it, but you are handling it. How are you doing that? Let's find those tools. How, are, how is the church still alive after all that we've gone through? We have the Holy Spirit. He is called the comforter, the teacher, the guide in these chapters, which would have reminded the apostles of Isaiah 9 verse 6. The words said about Jesus are also applied to this Holy Spirit. And so... Jesus lets us know that his absence doesn't necessarily mean absence because the Holy Spirit will fill those roles daily and constantly in the lives of those people who are entering this unprepared world. This is no, read this passage, John 13, and, and so in scripture, you will find this is no rah-rah pregame speech. This isn't a book, a how-to book on how to reach the lost or a soul-winning church-planting paradigms. No, it is a new way to exist. What was up is now down. Who used to be the power center isn't powerful anymore. It is the servant who is powerful. It is the lowly who is powerful. Everything has changed. No longer do we go out and find people and bring them into a single closed community as the Jews were for many, many years. Instead, well, we don't bring them to a centered table, uh, temple. rather. Instead, we are the temple and the power of God that filled the temple. Check those out when they open the temple, both the first and the second one. Again, thunder, lightning, fire, smoke, uh, wind, the sound of wind. All of this indicates that the cherubs and the seraphs and the Holy Spirit had shown up. That same power is now in us quietly. Quietly. We, it's too bad that most churches try to drag Jesus back into the temple instead of being the temple and walking along the road, being mobile temples where people can see Jesus. Flashback to where we already read, so we won't read it again. Acts 1, 4 through 11. Jesus has died. He has risen. He has served them breakfast, if you remember. He has blessed them. Now he's ascended into heaven. And the angels say, and you're waiting for what? Go. Get started. You heard the man move. You know what that reminds me of? 
That odd passage, I heard a lot of sermons about this where they are working hard trying to find a good application for Jesus looking at Peter and saying, do you love me? This wasn't about Peter denying Christ because they'd already had a private discussion that Luke just mentions they had. And Peter is now brave and strong and he's not the same guy. So that's not this. And if you remember three times, he said, do you love me? And Peter goes, yes, I do. And he'd say, feed my sheep. Or he'd say, feed my lambs. And there are people that have, have written books trying to make those words so different that Jesus was saying three things. No, he wasn't. He was saying, do you love me? Yes. Well, feed my sheep. Okay. Peter, you're still here. Do you love me? Yes. Go. I, uh, I've ended sermons before, and mainly Bible classes before. Uh, whenever I teach classes like I did this last week up uh, for the state of Ohio, I'll often end by saying, you know, that, that's it, that's the end, cheerio, go away. And people laugh because that's not the usual way one ends. But I can't help but think of Peter and Jesus in that discussion and the angels here saying, all right, you heard the man, go. What are you waiting for? Feed my sheep. You're going to be sent into Jerusalem with a crash course in the Holy Spirit and admonitions to be servants, humble, representatives of Jesus, mobile temples of God. And they know one thing for certain, Jesus isn't going to be there. These are real people. They're not characters in a book. They're, they would feel, as we've used before in the other sermons, like a little duck leaving a culvert or attack chihuahuas trying to repel invaders. Inadequate. Frightened. Abandoned. Abandoned? Maybe. What happens next should land with all the power of the arrival of alien ships in our skies. The disciples are baptized in the Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 5, verse 8. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. It's not just the apostles, there are over 100. They're filled with the Spirit, the book of Acts says. In Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 9. They're said to have received the Spirit. They are said to have been given the Spirit. Notice what didn't happen. It's always important to see what didn't happen and wasn't said in a story. You will never understand that unless you try it. The Spirit didn't come upon them to give them new insights or new information about what people were thinking how much they should give, who has a demon, or what the sign of the end of the world is. Why in the world do people think that's what the Holy Spirit does for them now? It's not what he did for them. People who are in search of power and meaning, you know, that my life matters and I have meaning because I can do these special things. They will say the Spirit gave me this miraculous power. Well, I'm not here to tell you what the Spirit can and cannot do because frankly, I don't know. He didn't tell me didn't tell you either and what he does in your life let's just thank God for but in Acts they're given the spirit so that they may speak of Jesus and be more like Jesus to reach the most people for Jesus and love them as Al might have said to remember rules one and two the early Christians, those who were disciples, but not apostles, saw that spirit come upon the disciples and they saw his presence and they felt his power. In Acts chapter 2, verse 3, verse 33, chapter 4, verse 31. Good reminder here, in every one of our sermons, there are notes and those notes are in the description box on YouTube. They are free, download them. They are also copyright free. You can preach this and claim you did it on your own, but that would be naughty. Just preach it. You don't have to give me any credit at all. It could be, like I said, that I'm absorbing things from Francis Chan and Tim Woodruff here. It's really hard to go back and check. The fact is, none of us got this firsthand. Everything we know about Jesus, we've learned. And we pass it on. Early Christians saw this power. <coughs> Excuse me. They heard his voice in Acts chapter 8, 10, 13, and 21. They could recognize his presence in others. Acts chapter 6, verse 3. I always like that when that happens. Whenever people go, wait a minute. These guys are from Galilee and they know stuff. You see, <laughs> the Galileans were looked upon as the boondocks, other side of the tracks, the unteachable, the ignorant, the unlearned. And by their accents, 
they, their accent was so thick, it was just known that a Galilean couldn't even learn a foreign language. And they're going, wait a minute, these are Galileans, and yet something's happened here. Yeah. And by the way, all through the book of, uh, of Acts, which teaches us about how we formed communities, it's not a book about rules, about organization, and about worship. It is a story unfolding in a variety of unprepared cultures that meet Jesus through these people. And so we see his encouragement, the Holy Spirit's encouragement and support in Acts chapters 4, 8, 9, 16, um, and 13. Got that out of order, 13 and 16. In Acts, we see what it looked like and felt like to take the Jesus story and underline and his example into a broken world that was not prepared for him, just like ours. And we see the Spirit of God working with common people like you and me. Or he'll go get the chief of sinners, self-proclaimed, Saul of Tarsus, and transformed him through the Holy Spirit to become the beloved apostle Paul. We see Peter transformed. We see women rising up and taking their place in this community alongside men. We see people transformed, translated, changed, empowered to do great things not the abracadabra that we'd like. And we'd all like that. We would all like that. I can remember one time early on when we'd returned to America that we drove by a car that was the side of the road, hood up, the guy looking at it. And um, my, my wife, this is again, back then people didn't have phones. And she goes, should we stop? And I said, I don't know anything about cars. He probably doesn't need somebody just to frown at it with him. And then I pushed the point a little bit far because it had a bumper sticker that said I'd rather push a Ford than drive a Chevy. And it was a Ford. And I thought, the man has achieved nirvana. Um, this is where he wanted to be. So, uh, and again, I can be a jerk and I can forget, but we'd seen the movies, so we didn't stop in the dark with the man sitting there. And, but I thought about that a lot later. Wouldn't it have been great for me to be able to go over and just say, by the power of the Holy Spirit, and lay hands on the Ford, and it works now? You think if I could do that, that I wouldn't? Are you kidding? I'd be running in parking lots instead of talking to you right now. But God has very little interest in cars working or houses not needing roofs. He's interested in his souls, people, transformation. And that's what the Holy Spirit is in you to do. Last week, we asked you if you would please bless people with $17. And the stories are coming in. This week, I'm not going to put a number on it. I'm going to ask you, look for a way to bless people. You've already started. Find another way. It might be money, but it might not be. Share a gift. Share a moment. Share an encouragement. And let us know how it changed, how it changed you as well as the other. This should become as natural to us as breathing.